Welcome to a new episode of Outside the Panels with your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes. Welcome everyone to an episode of Outside the Panels. I'm your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes. Now, after having a fair few Kickstarters on the show, um, I thought it was about time that we uh, we go walking in big indie press. And who can say there's a company any bigger than Dark Horse Comics? Up for you is a writer with a book that's out right now. So you're going to watch this pod, then you're going to run out and buy the book. Simple. Dead easy, right? Have I ever lied to you before? Mm. All right. Straight up. Let's get involved. This is Mr. Daniel Friedman. Daniel, how's it going? Great. Thank you for having me. Good to you be are, here. You are more than welcome. I like I like the contrast that we've got going on here. So I'm in I'm in the middle of the UK. It mm-hmm. is 7 p.m. on a stormy winter's night, and you look I'm like in you're sun, sunny sun LA. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man, somebody's somebody's living right in here, ain't me. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I uh, I grew up here, so I uh, I didn't have a, it wasn't a choice, but yeah, it it is quite nice here year round. So cool, not complaining. Yeah. Well, unless you're talking NFL, but I'm not going to say anything about that. Go Fins. Um, right, so let's talk about your book. You have a book out right now. It's um, a gorgeous hardcover. Uh, Kali, have I pronounced it correctly? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what's the story? What's, what's, the, what's the idea behind this book? Um, so I'll try to keep it short and sweet and not ramble too much. Um, Kali is a uh, revenge fantasy set in a, uh, some would call it a post-apocalyptic or apocalyptic uh, desert. Um, mm-hmm. And it tracks the story of uh, Kali, the leader of a biker gang who has been poisoned, stabbed in the back and betrayed by her own gang and uh, has set out for revenge. And um, she's being pursued by a, uh, a authoritarian army that has taken over. And so she's got a fascist army hot on her tail, and she's going to stop at nothing to get her revenge, even when, if it's the last thing she does. <laughs> when you say stabbed in the back, mm-hmm. you don't mean like betrayed. Well, that happens, but you're talking literally, literally and figuratively. Yeah, <laughs> as as you can see on the cover. Yeah. So the I've got to say, I looked at this book, and it was it's it, it's a big book. There's a lot of pages, and Normally when I see a book of a lot of pages, I'm like, oh. and then I start going through it, right? Your book, man, the pace of it is just electric. It just starts and just like it warps speeds. How do you kind of, art, I guess is kinetic because you've got to show the, the motion of the characters. Writing isn't quite as obviously as kinetic. How do you manage to keep that kind of pace going through? Um, well, with this book, I mean, in the way that I generally write is um, I am pretty specific about panel to panel. And so, you know, every little beat of action is, is broken down into the script. Um, I'll include camera angles and action and as much detail as necessary to, you know, tell the story. And then from there, uh, Robert Samaline, um, the artist on the book, picks it up and, and just makes everything better and makes it all work and <laughs> sing and and dance and and do everything it needs to so um but yeah i do tend to um be pretty specific um i have a background in film editing and so i try to bring that to my scripting and my writing um Mm -hmm. and storytelling and so yeah the beat by beat panel to panel pacing is something that's very important to me and i put a lot of time into that it shows it absolutely shows for for such a long book it's just shy of 200 pages i mean this is a compliment I was done with it. I was like, fifteen minutes. I was like done. I was. I couldn't. That's I fast. Like, yeah. I was like, whoa, those what? Pages. <laughs> I was like, what? Whoa! I just. I couldn't stop. I was like, right. What's next? What's next? Um, there's a lot of influences on show. We're going to have a look at the book in a little while. There's a lot of influences on show. So you've got like that post-apocalyptic future kind of Mad Maxi type of thing. You've got it's ultra violent. A little mm-hmm. bit of John Wick in there, you know, because. Some of the characters take some punishment. And then she's being chased by the cops, so really that's smoking the bandit, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, all the above. Um, the uh, I, I think the influence for us, I mean, so 
I guess to back up real quick, this book took Robert and I uh, seven years to complete. Um, so wow. it's, it's amazing that you can read, you know, seven years of work in half an hour, but, um, you know, it's a good but, half uh, an hour. Don't, <laughs> don't say, it's not an insult. It's a compliment. It's a good half an oh, hour. Oh no, I know. Yeah. I it's mean, an action and, book. And the, totally. And the, you know, the goal for us when we started was to essentially do a, a and the whole book would just be one long action sequence. Um, and it would mm -hmm. never really let up. And, um, so yeah, we started the book in 2014 with, you know, very ambitious, um, project and we had our sort of influences, you know, Robert and I both have a love of, uh, you know, what you would call trash cinema, the seventies and eighties grindhouse drive-in type movies, mm -hmm. movies that have fantastic posters that the movie very uh, often does not live up to. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to make one of those type of stories, but actually deliver on, you know, what the poster promised. And so our influences ranged from everything from Sergio Leone, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, which is a big influence on the setting um, mm -hmm. and the world. And, you know, as well as things like Switchblade Sisters and Bronx Warrior 99 and all of these, you know, oh, silly hero movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, oh, oh, man, I remember, <clears throat> I remember watching like a Bronx movie style uh, back when I was a kid in the 80s and I shouldn't have been watching it. Should not. And I think it was my first introduction to the idea of you can wear thigh high boots and stockings underneath. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, what's what you wear? And I, it was too, totally ludicrous, totally ludicrous. But it was, yeah, like, wow. So, um, so yeah, so we had a you know, we took all these different influences, different things that we've always loved, and you know, a lot of the aesthetics of these things, and you know, try to ele elevate them and do something different with them. Um, and I mean, all of those movies are Mad Max ripoffs at the end of the day. I mean, they were all mm. influenced by, you know, the couple of great films coming out at the time. Mm. Um, and so ironically, like I said, we started this in 2014 and then in 2015, Mad Max Fury Road came out and was, a, you know, essentially one long action sequence. And um, I love that movie. It's one of the, you know, one of the best action films ever made. Um, and it was, uh, you know, validating to see that you could actually do a story that never let up because oh, okay. you know the uh most people would say that you can't do that you gotta stop and set up your do this and that and we just said to hell with all that we're gonna yeah. just go we were not tempted when it came when mad max came out we were not tempted like halfway through your book go god damn it son of a <laughs> i mean yes totally i mean in the theater i you know belted out and uh and but I couldn't, but I couldn't deny how fantastic that movie was. And so as, um, you know, ironic that it, we set out to do this thing and then, you know, George Miller ended up doing it himself. Um, it did show us that you could do it and it kind of set a, a good example of, of what to kind of, you know, it set, set the bar high for us to aim for. Yeah. Well, I have seen that movie and I have read your book and I know which one I prefer. It's not the movie. It's just uh... well, <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, that's high, that's incredibly high praise. Uh, <laughs> no, I, you know, this book is just for me. This book ticks all the boxes. I love I love the first John Wick movie. Mm -hmm. Right, I, and fair enough. Yeah, I know you say it's not. You could argue that John Wick, the the first movie, is not all action because you've got to get the setup with the dog and setup with the mm -hmm. car and all that sort of stuff. But once once that goes down. Boom, yeah, um, not a big fan of the others after that because to me, it's just it's more of the same. Yeah, and, and I'm kind of like, well, uh, this book, the characters for me, I, I liked, I like Callie. Um, I understood the message. I understood what she was about. I understood kind of the the trouble, the the, the, the situation she was in. There are a couple of surprises in there. I'm not going to spoil it for anybody. You want to know what I'm talking about? Go buy the book. Uh, simple lines, right? Um, I have to say, I absolutely love the cover as well. So there you go. There's our cover. A couple of things I like about this cover. Um, sets the scene straight away. And you give credit to the letterer. Nobody gives the letterer's credits on the cover. That's impressive. Very cinematic. Is this, again, another aesthetic from your, your film editing history? The kind of that movie poster thing? Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, when we... when. You know, Robert and I largely worked on this book in secret for, you know, six, six and a half years. And we got almost all the way done with it um, before we kind of showed 
anyone, you know, no one, no one really knew about it. And so I, I brought it to Dark Horse um, and they immediately, you know, jumped on it. And, and um, one of my requests to them was is if we could publish it in an oversized hardcover format. And um, not only did they agree to do so, they actually made it even bigger than I ever would have expected. So the book sits almost 13 inches tall. And so we ended up designing the cover after finding out that we're going to have this really tall, larger book. And so mm -hmm. the cover was designed to take advantage of that size. And so, yeah, we just put Kali on the cover. Um, one of my you know, biggest influences is, is and loves is, was Frank Frazetta growing up. And mm -hmm. I've always been inspired by his compositions and, and it, it's not exactly a Frazetta type image but there's a energy to it that I think is reminiscent of and that's just something Robert and I tried to bring to it but yeah the, the goal was to take advantage of the height and um and and create a cover that when you walk into a bookstore or a comic book shop you would see it from across the room she would stand out she would tower over all the other books and you mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to miss her so I I think the, you know, and I've and I've I've walked in the shops and seen the book in various places, and it always seems to jump out um, and you know draw your eye. So I I think this sort of simpler, uh, cleaner approach to the cover was was a uh, was a good move on our part. I mean, we had other cover ideas that were much more of the traditional you know montage type poster with all yeah. the characters, and um, we ended up going with this more simple version. No, I I have I've not seen the other covers. Uh, I will say that this is striking i, I understand where where you say it's not frazetta esque in like the style with the but when you look at the kind of the energy she's a she's a statuesque woman mm -hmm. you know, she's, yes she is <laughs> she's got the curves in all the right places all right she might not be vampy svelte but you know you can see you know and of course the imagery there you've got the chaps on showing you she's a biker Tells you there's the knife's there, the cuffs are there, the gun's there, the the butt holster, all of it's there. The kind of indicates the type of road warrior style that you're going for, at least aesthetically. So that's cool. Yeah, I mean it's yeah, it's all in the it's all in the <laughs> image. I mean that's another big thing for me, you know, which is something I've taken from Frazetta is is you know how much story can you tell in a single image, mm. and how much can you learn about a character in one pose. Um, you know, one image. And so, um, you know, I, I do have to give a lot of the credit to Robert realizing this cover and, um, and, you know, he, he deserves all of it. So, um, but yeah, that was the, the, the design idea for it. What is it like then? Cause I, always, it's, it's funny you mentioned, you know, your history in the film. Cause I, I always think of writers as a kind of director anyway, you know, cause they're kind of like, trying to move the pieces and then the artist is the actor comes in drops the performance and says da-da everyone goes whoa well done great show um and comics to that kind of um cohesiveness mm -hmm. but it's more obvious because everyone sees the art and not the writing straight away so with your mind focused on aesthetics as much as writing how is it working with someone like robert i can't pronounce his name is it samalin who mm -hmm. Hey, um, I have a mutant ability to get, I get everybody's <laughs> name wrong. It's just, he nailed it. Yeah, I think I get mine right sometimes. Um, so how does he take that, that direction? Because it's kind of, you know, a lot of artists are built up on the whole Marvel way, the whole there's the bare bones, knock yourself out sort of thing. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I, I kind of got my start um, in comics working at Marvel back in the 2010 um, as a colorist. And um, and so I would see the scripts, you know, at Marvel and the way that the Mar you know the Marvel way that they work, and it would be, you know, a paragraph kind of outlining what happens yeah. in the story, and then the artist would have to kind of pick it up from there, and and work with that, and uh, you know that that doesn't appeal to me as much. And so, again, I have such an interest in the visual storytelling aspect of it, you know, in addition to the dialogue and the characters mm. and, the, and the narrative, how the story is told is very important to me. And so I, like I said, I put a lot of um you know detail into the script um but at the same time you know while i have all of this i have this sort of vision for it and i you know do my part to direct that um robert is just an unbelievably brilliant artist and um he you know he's an art director himself he works in video games oh, okay, um, cool. yeah and so he would take anything i wrote or that we talked about and just make it so much better 
um, he really is an, you know, unparalleled talent. And, um, uh, you know, we had a really great kind of simpatico. Our minds just met. We didn't have to say much. We always mm. just knew what the other was thinking or was going to do. And he got everything I, you know, I put down and, and, you know, and so it just, it worked really well. I mean, it was kind of, it had its own magic, uh, mm. our collaboration. So I don't want to, you know, take too much credit because um, <laughs> Robert is, you know, this book wouldn't be anything without him. Yeah. And that's a fair, that's a fair shout. The, the book is gorgeous. I don't think, I don't think there's any panel that catches my eye for the wrong reason. And when you're talking yeah. 200 pages, that's, that's a, that's a, a good return for your money. Definitely. Um, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, like I said, it took us seven years. I mean, the, the amount of, of uh, time Robert put into, into drawing this thing is just unbelievable. I mean, like you said, every single image is been, you know, painstakingly reworked and, and designed and, and, and thought over. And, um, yeah, I mean, it took us a long time, but, it, I think that shows in the work. I mean, it's, it is, uh, you know, not to speak for myself, just to talk about how great Robert is. Um, it, it just, you know, I think it's incredibly apparent. Um, so, so I, I, I agree. You know, I'm, 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 on, your, I'm yeah. on your side on this one. <laughs> yeah. Rich and the Converted. All right. So this is the start of the book. Um, very cinematic, very, I can hear that sort of like Western music playing in my ears as I'm, as I'm watching this going through chains and then that's kind of the hint that you know what we're not in kansas anymore um and then as things progress we get to see the grandeur of the of the event and and where they are there's cars and stuff i've got to say it's just so well detailed when i, I obviously you're saying you, you're putting the, the direction down on the page mm -hmm. i mean look at the shadows the sh oh. I'm just, I often see artists who are good at one thing or the other, mm -hmm. yeah, not all the whole thing put together. So I would, yeah, I would no, Robert's the total package. Um, you know, and it's, it's amazing that this is, a, you know, he's done some short stories and a bunch of cover art over the years, mm -hmm. but this is effectively his first book. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, he, it's a mic drop for him as far as I'm concerned. Regarding the writing, because you're talking, we're talking the various influences on there. And you've got, <clears throat> you've got that kind of road warrior thing going on. She's out mm -hmm. for revenge. You know, we, we've mentioned some of the nuances already. How difficult is it as a writer not to fall into trope territory or cliche territory? Um, I mean, I guess that depends on, um, <laughs> on how good of a writer you are. I mean, the, you know, tropes, are tropes because sometimes they work and mm -hmm. oftentimes they're overused and that's when they stop working mm -hmm. um you know for this book because of you know the idea was to essentially have a non-stop action sequence um we kept the story pretty simple you know it's a, in in that way and so be, otherwise you would have to kind of explain and set up a lot more but mm -hmm. because it's such a uh you know easily understood narrative you know Kali has a one goal and mm -hmm. she spends the book trying to achieve that goal. Um, and so, you know, revenge stories are, uh, you know, a very heavily populated genre. There's a lot of good and a lot of bad, different movies, games, video, uh, mm -hmm. comic books. You know, there's a lot of books about revenge. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, trying to kind of, and I, and I would consider myself pretty well versed in all of those things. I've, you know, watched So what you're saying years. is don't, don't don't annoy you, or else you'll be out for revenge. And I won't say. Well, I I, I would hope that I've also learned my lesson that revenge <laughs> isn't always worth it. Um, I think that that's uh, you know, revenge can go two ways or maybe three ways, but you know either you know, whatever. I, I don't want to say too yeah, much yeah, yeah, yeah. in the book. Yeah, but um, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So the idea, I mean, I think if you're going to have a a story that's so heavy on action in such a kind of complex world. You want to keep your story simple so that the reader can hop on board page one. They know exactly what's going on. They know exactly what the character's desire is. Um, and if you understand that, then you can, you know, emotionally get into it. Um, and and hopefully, Kali resonates in that way. And um, you're you're on the you're on the 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 ride, the road, or the uh, the trip, whatever you want to call it. Very good. Um, 
I was absolutely, I was surprised. I'm going to, I'm, I'm wary of what I'm going to say here. I, having read lots of comic books in the past, I didn't know where this was going to go. I was ultimately surprised. Yeah, satisfied. So there you go. Yeah, I, I mean, that I was one of the... What that uh... says, other than the fact I might be whatever, but I, you know, I mean it as a compliment again. You know, the yeah, no, that... I appreciate it. I, um, I mean, I, I kind of... One of the one of the people who taught me a lot of what I know about comics and how to tell a story visually was when I worked did all my work with Tom Coker um, on Undying Love back in almost ten years ago, and I remember asking him, you know, what makes a good ending in a comic, because it's different than a book or a movie. Um, you you know, there's the comics function differently, and he mm -hmm. said, you know, you want to have a twist that subverts everything that's happened, but then you need to still deliver on what was promised. And so I've always kind of st you know, that stayed with me. And so mm -hmm. you want something that upends the whole story, but then you still want to deliver on what you've promised, cool. you know, at the beginning. Very good. Um, I think that's a talent that you have used well throughout this book. There are, there are a couple of table setting moments throughout the book. Um, I get that the idea is to be action page one all the way through. But there comes a point where you have to just like, you know, just fold the table down again because we're going to start again and, go, and keep going at it. I think those bits are well nuanced. You know, I think you've got the pace absolutely right where you kind of hit a hit a point and think, right, that that that's it. That's as high as I can go right now. So let's just start it down and then you can start again. And, yeah, know. you have to. I mean, part of the pacing is you know you have to have higher highs and lower lows as as the book continues. And I mean, I think to say that it's non, you know, it is nonstop action, but maybe no, it's more it's... accurate to say that it's just more, it's, it's a linear story in terms of its space yeah. of time. And so it's not to say that it's 200 pages of fist fighting, but that the story just continues from where it starts. Yeah. Um, and so there's this <laughs> linear progression as she gets deeper and deeper into this conflict. And um, yeah, that, that has to be, part of the of the scripting and of the storytelling because you can't you know you can't blow it all up in the on the in the beginning because then you have nowhere else to go after that so yeah that all has to be structured and that that is a big part of it um and the other thing that we wanted to take great care with is that we wanted to treat each action scene um or sequence sort of in its own unique way and so i think if you go through the book you know there's no the action isn't repetitive it's not like mm. every single scene is her shooting 30 people mm. or you know having a fist fight with 15 different people yeah. um, you know each scene is its own sort of unique thing um mm. and then also in the way that each scene is depicted um you know the the style in which each each action sequence is designed um the camera angles um you know we wanted to make sure that each one was unique um, cool. so they all kind of function a little bit differently who voted for the nine panel page? Um, I, that's again, that goes, that's all on the script. So, oh man, that's so Watchmen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the nine panel grid is is uh, all over the place, but yeah, I mean, definitely Watchmen's did did it one of the best. So, yeah, if, if not one of the first, I'd imagine, but you know, I, I see it, I see it a lot, but uh, right, yeah. we're good. Sorry, go on. <laughs> no, no, go, go right, we're gonna take a quick break for one of our other shows. Um, where shall we go? Um, I tell you what, one of my favorites. You never know, you might get one of these in your stocking down the line. It's Crisis in the Toyverse. <laughs> There you go, Crisis and Toyverse. If you like figures and you like uh, 
female action figures, well, you know what? Buy the book, and Daniel might get you know might get a deal. Speak to Todd McFarlane, get a McFarlane toy out of Cali. I I would love nothing more than a to see a Cali <laughs> statue. So I, I, I you know what? If you had a statue with that cover. I would be all over that, like, like exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's that's that would be the statue. So yeah, spot on. I would, I would buy that all day and twice on a Sunday. All right, excellent. We talked about before the break. We talked about the action scene. I'm not going to go too much into the book because I want people to go and buy the book. But one of the earliest action scenes we get to see the sort of viciousness and the violence within the book is this kind of this kind of prison break styley thing going on there. You've got. Um, the focus of the eye, so you know something's going to go on. You've got the extended middle panel there with the the, the leg kick and so on. The color scheme changes. Did Robert provide his own colors? Or yes, he did. Yeah. Yes. So the color scheme changes, and that that's apparent in in other sections of the book. The kind of like it's like a visual, I suppose, recognition that something bad's going to happen. I suppose down the line, um, unbelievable. So when you talk about pacing that and you talk about the camera angles, this is just a fine example of it, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you you can go to the next page and see that nine-panel grid you just you had mentioned. I hate, um, I hate nine-panel grids. <laughs> I mean, I, um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, I think the, the color there is, you, um, you know, the idea with the color is to sort of, you know, be more evocative of uh, mm-hmm. where Kali's feeling emotionally and what she's kind of going through. So you know, this scene's in red because this is sort of, this is where it all kind of starts. This is the mm-hmm. initial uh, breakout because um, she's the book, the beginning of the book, she's been captured. And so uh, as soon as she finds out that her, some of her former gang members are at this military base that she's been mm-hmm. imprisoned at, uh, you know, this is it for her. Even if it's, uh, again, the last thing she does, she's going to get these girls that betrayed her. So this is her initial breakout. It's where her rage begins. And so red was appropriate for for this moment. I will say I was I was impressed by the lack of exploitation in this book. When you hear when you hear the idea of of a female character in prison out for revenge, the front cover's got handcuffs on. You think there's something shady going down. So um, you didn't go down that path at all. You yeah. I mean, again. Again, I, I, I love those movies, but they are, you know, uh, problematic and um, not always fun. And so I think for us, I mean, we really wanted to keep it fun mm-hmm. and, um, you know, like you said, not really exploit our characters. I mean, mm-hmm. Kali's a force of nature. There's, there's, there's no exploiting. I mean, to exploit her would kind of, you know, fly in the face of, of who and what she is. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah so i mean i just think we we kind of admired our girls too much to to treat them in in any ill way so haphazard manner (laughs) yeah yeah and so i mean yeah we we like those aesthetics and again like if you think about the posters to those kinds of movies those exploitation films they have these awesome posters Mm -hmm. the movies very rarely lived up to what those posters promised you know i always wanted a you know a, a bigger kind of action story and i you know you get this other kind of weird stuff so um we wanted to deliver on again like what those kinds of images would promise and so um yeah i mean i think we we toy the line on on playing with some of those tropes and what people Mm -hmm. some of those expectations and then hopefully subvert them and do something different with them no i agree wholeheartedly i think the the book's better for it yeah i i agree um yeah yeah, totally because it it would be so easy to just go down that route and just boof that have have like that sex scene or have that that element into it and you kind of like no no that's not what this is about you know, yeah about exactly that. yeah yeah, yeah. So, and don't get me wrong there's there's books you can buy that and that's fine you know if that's you know that's your thing that's your thing great go for it there's loads of good books out there that feature around that but this isn't one of them this is something completely different so yeah. I, was, I, I quite like i quite like the idea that you stayed away from that so I was yeah, again yeah, impressed. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I do love this book, so you know, I could talk about it for ages. Um, when we talk about inspirations, we talked about, I suppose, um, the influences of the different movies uh, and and stuff that sort of mm-hmm. made the book. What? Who are your influences? Who are you reading right now, for example? What? what are you still buying comics? Um. So let's see, comics. Um. The, I just read a, a, awkward silence and goes, no, 
I've never yeah. finished a comic for the last I don't. Years. I don't read a, <laughs> a terrible amount of um, American books. I don't read a, a lot of big two stuff. I'm not. I've never been a big kind of superhero guy. Um, mm -hmm. I've always been much more drawn to the European comics, um, French books specifically, um, as well as manga. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, I, I will, but I will um, say I just read Rick Remender and Andre Lima Arojo's uh, Righteous Thirst for Vengeance. Um, oh, and that okay. is the best book I've read in years. Um, oh. Unbelievably good book. Um, high, I can, I, that's like the highest recommendation I can give right now. So um, what they did on, what they did on that book is, is, is fantastic. And, and like the art, I mean, Andre is just amazing. So. Yeah. Do you find it hard to, for, for me, I'm a huge American football fan, right? Uh -huh. And I used to play over here. Believe it or not, I used to be a wide receiver. Um, now I'm just someone who's wise. I used to be a lineman. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Without you guys, nothing gets done. That's the way it works. Yeah. Um, so because I used to play, when I sit and watch football on telly now on TV, I lose some of the, some of the magic's gone. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, look, the safeties took a step backwards. Oh, the safety stepped up. You're going to do a play action where he's going to take two steps over the top. There's 15. You know what I'm saying? You can, you know, and you spot how the linemen are standing. Is it and going to pass protection and all that sort of stuff? Is that, do you worry that comics and, and movies can be like that for someone like yourself who is used to creating that the magic's gone? So you can see behind the veil a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it, it, um, I wouldn't say it's an issue, but it is something that does come up. But but I will say when a book or a movie um, can still capture me and mm -hmm. pull me in, there's almost no greater joy. It's it's harder for a book or a movie to do that. But when mm -hmm. it does, I appreciate it so much because it can it can do that in the face of me knowing all of the background and, you know, yeah. how the machine works and how it, all the gears turn. Um, you know, but it, it does, it gives me a kind of a more critical eye. Um, and it, it just makes me, uh, yeah, I tend to look at things. I try to look at them just as like an audience, just as the viewer would. Yeah. Um, but it, but when it doesn't work, I tend to notice it more, but then when it does work and it's great, um, I, it, I appreciate it even more because I know how difficult, you know, it is to do, to do it yeah, and pull it off. So it. that's a good way of looking at it. Spot on. Cool. Um, collaborating on comic books. How how difficult, how different is that to say collaborating in, in film studies or film media and stuff like that? Do, do you find that the collaborative element in comics is, is more 50-50 because the art, or is it more so because the art is the thing that draws the, the, the reader's eye? Yeah, it, they're totally different. Um types of relationships uh, you know film tends to be highly uh hierarchy hierarchical um you know where you have your director and the, even above them your producers sometimes um who yeah, dictate down that. the line I've you know they that. sit yeah they, they you know the uh it rolls downhill um in that way and and um you as like as an editor or any other crew per, you know crewman on a on a job whether it's mm -hmm. whatever role you're in um you're always serving the director's uh vision in that way and that's your job is to help them achieve what they want and mm -hmm. oftentimes uh figure out how to actually make it work because they don't know how to uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and in comics it is a um at least for me and what i've found with my collaborators is like this truly enriching collaborative amazing relationship where you actually get to create with someone else and mm. when you you know when you're able to kind of figure it out what you want to do and meet your minds can meet in the middle you know you can kind of give birth to something that's greater than either of you could have done you know alone and mm. yeah so like with Kali like I could never have you know uh you know, rendered and, and illustrated something as gorgeous as what Robert did. And, and mm -hmm. I don't think he would have, um, you know, drawn a 178 page book or whatever it is, yeah. um, you know, without, without the script and the story and, and 
me hounding him for all those years to keep going, um, you know, cause I, I had, you know, my job is in addition to writing is to be the cheerleader and to keep, yeah. keep the, uh, the, you know, the energy going and the yeah. juices flowing. Um, so yeah, they're very, very different. I, I will admit that I find co creating comics so much more, uh, delightful and, um, that, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like enriching and just, mm -hmm. you know, it sparks it joy. Yeah. It sparks joy. I mean, it really mm -hmm. does feel good to actually get to create something because as opposed to film where you have, you know, you have studios and financiers and you have all these people that, that not only do you have to seek their approval in order to do something, they also all have their own ideas and and desires and they want to get their cousin to be in the movie and this guy wants to have his friend in this scene and this actor wants more screen time um and so this person you know, wants flowers in the dressing room and this person wants yeah even the stuff that doesn't make it in, on into the movie or on camera um there's even more stuff behind the scenes like that yeah so you know comics in that way is just it's pure you know it is yeah. it is it and that is what's so great about it and and um what i love about about it is um just the ability and to be able to actually create something that that you know that i and my collaborator want and there's no one else that can tell us what to do or if we can do it um or if you know we have to do x y or z to you know check off whatever other boxes so um it's it's really wonderful it's it's cool. great i suppose then my last question just to tie all that together then um the indie market over the last five years has actually it's exploded absolutely as much as as much as spider-man superman batman are always going to sell comics um the indie market is where a lot of people are, are going to part of that is because like creators like yourself put out fantastic product um and it's your product it, you can do whatever you like with it you can do the, the story can go anywhere do you find working with someone like dark horse how how's that how's that relationship work for you because dark horse are one of the as i said right at the start of the show they might not be the biggest player that they used to be now because of image and and mm -hmm. other kind other other publishers that are coming out there obviously dark horse has lost a couple of the franchises to to marvel but they're one of the mainstays you know they've got like such a good pedigree of storytelling and creator own stuff what's it like putting stuff out with dark horse i mean it's 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 awesome i mean it's, i grew up you know everything i read growing up dark horse published you know from all the frank miller sin city books um to you know some of my first uh you know manga i read like blade mm -hmm. of the immortal and lone wolf and cub um they've and they've always kind of i mean they've been around since i don't know what year but it's like the early 80s maybe mid yeah, yeah. It, it, um, went to Alien vs. Predator was one of the earliest books. The yeah, Mask, Alien vs. Predator. I remember those. Yeah. Those were great. And uh, uh, if it wasn't for Dark Horse, there'd be no Star Wars universe. Dark Horse kept the Star Wars flame alive when nobody else was interested. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they did. I mean, they've they've had a long record of of servicing, you know, licenses and properties as well as bringing over, you know, books from overseas. Um, I just recently on eBay bought a whole, the, uh, the whole run of Cheville Noir, which was their series in the eighties, mm -hmm. their, their month, I think it was monthly or quarterly, um, you know, floppy book that, that, uh, serialized all these European artists. I mean, it was like one of the first times Mobius appeared in America mm -hmm. was in mm -hmm. Cheville Noir. And, um, and so getting to work with them, it, it feels like I'm, I'm, I feel really proud to, you know, be a part of that legacy in whatever form you know and they've been incredibly supportive uh to me and you know my other books i've done there as well raiders and bird king and um so I've, i'm very happy i mean they've again they, I, I can't say enough nice things about them um you know and they published kali so beautifully yeah. i i'm so so pleased with it i think every time i look at a dark horse book no matter what it is the quality just absolutely it feels it feels like i'm sitting down with like a tomb of work you know what i mean like a tomb of work where you just ah you know you sit down and you enjoy the reading experience yeah they make a, great books 
Yeah. You know, it's, that's its own art form, is, is the actual production of the book. But if the story inside isn't great, all you've got is a really nice looking bookcase. Right. right? True. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you do not fit within that, that criteria of this book is gorgeous to look at. The action is frenetic. The character, you will fall in love with her just for her sass, her attitude, her one-mindedness. It is absolutely a joy to read. You know, action, action all the way through. Yeah, it may be, but you can't help but get swept up in it. And that's down to you and your fantastic writing. So thank you, Daniel, for putting this work, this book together with Robert. I absolutely enjoyed it massively. Thank you so much. It was uh, all our pleasure and it means the world to us that the book is finally out in the world and people are receiving it and enjoying it. So it's, it's been a great ride. So as Daniel mentioned, the book is out now. Go to your local comic book shop. If they do not stock them, leave that comic book shop and find another one. No, I'm joking. Get them to order it in. It's as simple as that. Um, you can follow Daniel on Instagram. The link is down there. Um, so you can follow Daniel's work and any other Cali news that comes up. I'm sure there'll be some art on there if you go looking for it. Just saying. Um, and that's about it for the show. Daniel, thank you for spending the time. I really do appreciate it. Thank you again for having me. It's been great. You, you are more than welcome, sir. Thank you for such a great book. And please pass on my thanks to everyone involved. Absolutely thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> Will do. Excellent. Don't forget to check out the UCPN. For all your favorite shows, including you saw it earlier, Crisis in the Toyverse, there might be a Cali statue on there sooner rather than later. You never know. And if you like your comics of a certain vintage, do not forget to check out the Old Timers Comic Book Show, where the hosts aren't old, but the comics most certainly are. Next up on that show will be Team Team Ups. God knows why they picked that. It was such a hard thing to find, but it'll be there. All right. I've been your host, Joining Machine Hughes. Daniel, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm out here. Adios. Visit UndercoverCapes.com for the latest and greatest podcasts via the Undercover Capes Podcast Network. Also visit our parent company website, ComicCrusaders.com, all about comic pop culture.